So I, I just I just wrote my updates and I, I ranted on wind for the, so did you, did you see where SPP won the appeal against the Wyoming uh, solar farm uh, wind farm? No. So the appeal so they charged them sixty two million dollars to become based to, to either you have to install the base load or SPP Southern Power Pool is going to have to go get base load. So they didn't do it. So they they sued because they were still going to charge them. The appellate court not only awarded SPP sixty two million, but they said that due to inflation and increasing unst- uh, instability in the grid, it was one hundred and two million. And now it's like people are starting to rethink their mathematics on, on what this is going to cost because either you're going to have to pay the ISO for it or you're going to have to install it, which is inherently going to increase your price of construction, which is going to increase the amount of uh, that you have to charge per megawatt hour. Again, increase the rate base. Yeah. Well, b- by ma- because once you get uh, once you put in for the megawatt hour that you need, it then goes to auction. And then the auction is just going to get like, just look at on um, PJM. I mean, PJM, you you had a, almost like a 400% increase. As a, as a MISO um, rate payer. That's, that's true. So let's, let's do this real quick. Cause I say we like should include all the stuff we just recorded in BD. This has been like cool stuff. Yeah. It's already on dude. We're recording, right? Okay. Kurt Mark and special guest Mark Orsano, C6 Capital, just flew in from New York. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Real quick, before we dig into these issues, because we just laid out our outline for the show. Uh, that was a Josh Young thing. He was like, y'all should give an outline at the beginning. And he's probably right about that. We've just never been organized enough. Real quick, y'all two, you weren't on it back in the day, but I did, on Chuck Yates Needs a Job, the energy policy draft. And yes. I had nine folks on. I made you energy czar of the world. <laughs> and I said, you get one pick of an energy policy Mark, you went first. Would you change your? Who did you pick, and would you change that today? Um, I picked natural gas at, as the one one. Yes, you were. That that might have been a little nepotism to give me the one one slot. Make I did. Uh, yes, I'd still choose natural gas, but with lesser conviction, just given all the momentum that's built around nuclear. Ah. Uh. You went four, right? You picked four, or was it three? I think it was three. Okay, you went three. Who did you choose, and would you would you retain that pick? Well, well, I I just got told that I was right, so I I, <laughs> went, I went I went nuclear, SMR uh, with a focus in building out Halo. Yeah, there you go. That was so much fun. How about you? Uh, I was solely the moderator with. I didn't. I don't think Stacy and I actually made a pick. I still think the best pick of the day was uh, DRW. DRW. <laughs> DRW comes on and he goes. He goes. I don't care if I'm choosing first or I'm choosing last. I'm taking coal because there's not much of it left, and I'll be the only warm motherfucker on the planet <laughs> <laughs> when y'all all run out of energy. I was and like, he, and he there said, he goes. Calgary's getting warmer. Great. Great. Yeah, might make this place bearable. Yeah. yeah so. All righty. So, Mark, kick us off on the floods. So, not a lot of information other than, you know, some of the just devastating clips that we're seeing. Of uh, We just saw one from Chimney Rock, which is the, I guess, the downstream terminus of all the debris field that um, has gotten hung up there. But, you know, basically towns are gone or mostly decimated. And this is in the... Yeah, you know, most of the news, at least from a headline standpoint, is around Asheville, but the comms are down. A lot of the roads are impassable. There's not yet a lot of information, still very much a search and rescue operation. Um, they showed the uh, the river district in Asheville, or someone was talking about it, where the water had receded, and, you know, it's, it's basically gone. Um, it's an area that is built in floodplain. And I think, you know, something that I paid attention to last night, there's a lot of gas lines showing up, uh, people running out of fuel and spending hours in in lines uh, to fill up. And Gas Buddy had had a thread out yesterday talking about, you know, it's not just a matter of having out of region haulers take fuel from just any random wholesale distribution terminal, there's a whole process um, 
that is based on a lot of regulatory layers where these tankers have to come in and be permitted and licensed into that particular facility. They have to actually go through training. They have to be approved for not only the product producers load, but also the customer. So it's, it's, it's a logistical nightmare that takes several days to sort out. And so this notion that, you know, we've got, um, this logistical over, overlay in an area that's got very little to no power and no fuel is is pretty devastating. But the, the notion that something this catastrophic mm-hmm. can get sorted out at least minimally logistically for within a few days is pretty pretty stunning. But just the the whole process of of how the fuel distribution works, I was a bit of a neophyte. Yeah, well, we we understand what that looks like we'd be remiss if we didn't say thoughts and prayers to everyone affected by it because this has been just incredibly nasty mark what did you see in new york about it because i i kind of found it interesting that it does it doesn't seem like this was a widely reported story as one you know as someone who's from houston close to new orleans saw katrina etc so uh, there's there's a lot that's been said about just how devastating just be and and one of the reasons we because a lot of people went from New York into this region over the last five years there that's so there's a lot of families there's a lot of ties back to it so there has been some decent coverage you know and and it's just the sheer amount of water that fell I think there was something like forty trillion cubic uh, you know forty trillion gallons uh, fell over a five day period when you think about just the sheer amount of water that came down. But then you look at the dams and the dams that held up, you know, the ones that were trying to hold back water where they could. I, I think it's more important to look at how can we manage this just like in 1916 when you had something similar happen in terms of the sheer devastation, there were there were things that changed afterwards. You know, how can we learn from this, take what happened and really remediate? You know, one of the things that we've seen uh, so far, there's uh, I think it's coming out of Tennessee and, and several other states. They've started creating a helicopter. Uh, so people who own helicopters and other types of equipment have actively been running their own dime, their own fuel, running lines to try to come in. We're starting to see looting pick up, which is an inherent problem. And and then obviously it gets politicized as everything else does because um, DeSantis said no to Sandy um, aid. And that was a whole big thing because it's like, oh, well, now you want to tap the government. It's like, well, you pay taxes for a reason. Your taxes go to provide goods and services to you as the as the taxpayer. And the fact that this can even remotely be said in terms of blue red, in the sense of like, oh, well, it, it, for red guy, for red states, you know, this is communism. It's like, well, no, because you had an extreme event that you need help and support coming back into. That's why you pay in. You have that store of value, and then it comes down when something like this happens. It's not being communistic or anything else. It's helping your fellow American. Well, it's which the I law. Think lost. Exactly. That, that's that is my, exactly. always my thing. Exactly. It is the system, you know. So, and there was, you know, opportunistic politi- polit- politicization. Um, I think the most obvious example was AOC's tweet uh-huh. linking it directly to fossil fuels and big oil, and. It's just stunning the speed at which that occurs, even before any kind of assessment can be made while the disaster is unfolding. That and it, it you know, it cuts both ways on both sides of the aisle. It's just, it's it, it's just an, an inability to constrain or resist the impulse. Yeah, and to score points. And to, and to that point, you know, when you look at 1916, you look at today and you look at how that's gone back and forth, it's like, well, it, it happens. You know, when, when you look at how wrong they were on the hurricane side and it's because the Atlantic cooled rapidly and they, that was so we did not have a very aggressive hurricane season, but yet, you know, to your point, it's immediately, oh, it's climate change. It's like, well, what was 1916? It's just, it's unfortunate that you're having these these events, but it is common to get something like this, especially something so fast moving that didn't lose any power once it got, and then it just sat there and just dumped all this rain. It's unfortunate. Look at Harvey. You know, Harvey just stopped, and it created this cap. You have a clay, it caps, and then it just fills up like a bathtub. 
you know, he had something very similar in terms of the way it would, it structured over that area. And Asheville sits at 2000 feet. I mean, it's got a lot of elevation and slope. And so you, you've got the whole suddenness and velocity contrast that with, I guess the worst flood in us history was the 1927 Mississippi river flood, multi-state event impacted 27,000 square miles. But if you live down in this region on the flat plains in the delta of, of the Mississippi River or any other river um, that has no ele- literally no elevation change, there's much more time to monitoring. But and, right. I think it's one of those. I think it's one of those things that now that we have 24-hour news cycles and cameras on everything, it's you know it's easy to say, well, that's climate change, even though. You look at data. Well, I think most of the kids that carry cell phones around that were native to social media, they don't even know what life was like before, quote unquote, climate change. And they don't know what life was like before, before social media. So, of course, everything that comes out of their mouth is it's climate change because we've been taught it's climate change. What does that mean? I don't know, but it's bad. <laughs> Weather events are bad. And, and that's just the narrative. And it's unfortunate. Because both sides of the aisle, but particularly one side, has politicized it in a way that has put, you know, oil and gas is evil. It's bad. Except, damn, you better give me oil and gas when I'm cold or I'm hot because you guys are price gouging me. I mean, it just goes on both ways, and it's it's unfortunate and, you know, sad what we see. So, so the or, in words matter here, and there was a nice distinction made by the controversial Chris Martz between natural hazards and natural disasters. And if you look at, as measured by central pressure at landfall since 1851, I forget what the hundreds of category three plus storms were, there's no discernible trend or correlation in terms of the increasing intensity or or frequency. It's like a 0.009 R square. But basically around 1950. But the fact is, we're making elective decisions to live in these areas that do have some non-zero probability of a natural hazard impacting you. And there's a lot more value in terms of human life right. and assets in, in areas that are, you know, at, at least in line over a hundred, 500 year period. So this type there's of four things just that the dollar amounts are just much, and, much larger. And there's four things that I'm curious why people are not talking about. One is when red ant fire ants were introduced to the United States. That's number one. That's a big problem. Came in on a fruit boat or whatever. Number two, the fucking cedar trees. Pain in the ass. Can't get rid of them. Third, carp. Damn those carp in the oceans. They, I mean, in the rivers, fuck everything up. And fourth, we're going to get to it. It's called offshore wind, but we'll ignore we'll, we'll that one. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's do this on the on the exit question. Does this in any way, shape, or form impact the election? Absolutely. And those and in, in a swing state, it, it, it probably will, depending on how who. It depends on who acts, who gets stuff done. We don't know yet. It's too early to tell. Um, and if that governor or people were Republicans, it'll help them. If they're Democrats, it's going to help the Democrats. So I think it will actually. What do you think? Yeah, Mark. I, I think in, you know, as close as North Carolina is, is there a chunk of meaningful chunk of voters that just will be unable to cast their votes? No. And what is the makeup of that region mm-hmm. because they're so displaced? Yeah. Trump, yeah. Trump's arguably stronger in the rural areas. I mean, early voting so. starts, what, here next weekend, weekend after next? Yeah. All right. What do you think, Mark? So, I think it will. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's similar to to your point about that if you're if you were already Republican, you're just going to look at this in action and say, oh, if a Republican was here, it'd be different. If you're a Democrat, you're going to say, well, we need help. We need something mm-hmm. else. So it's just going to be a matter of access. The one point that I thought was important in, in terms of the climate change. So as somebody who, who buys and owns dams, hydroelectric assets, I think it's important because people were blaming them for not pre-releasing water. Yeah. Oh, that's and, a big issue. Yeah. And and so they tried to say, when you look at the, your, your, uh, your water basin in terms of where you're feeding from, they talked about, we had no idea that you were going to get that much water. So there wasn't a lot of pre-release because it changed so rapidly, so quickly, so you couldn't do it. And, but then they did, and, and we knew how to build things a hundred years ago. 
you know, some of these dams started topping yeah. and nothing happened. And it's like, well, how about we take some of that money from the infrastructure bill and look at these dams, look at these assets that are hundred years old, because as someone who's buying them and high grading them, there's a lot of opportunity there. And, and I think there's ways that you could use that as a better flood control, especially as these, these events tend to get, you know, obviously bigger. You want to make sure that you can protect life. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, this does impact the election. Remember Katrina Bush waited two days to come back and was eviscerated. Mm -hmm. I do believe that was the moment in history when the media went from just kind of siding liberal to actually activist liberal. They figured out the power of yeah. narratives there. It's interesting. We haven't heard a peep out of the fact that it took the Harris key and Petty four days to comment on what's been going on. She put out a picture this morning where her ear pods aren't, you know, plugged into her, <laughs> into her cell, but she's supposedly on a call taking notes, but there's nothing written on the page. Did she have the Bluetooth earrings in? The, uh, <laughs> don't, don't know about that, but, uh, I do, I do think, I do think it's going to be used as a weapon, probably on both sides of just getting to the standstill. So, you know, we're blessed to have Mr. Rosano on because we have been fumbling around. I say we, I have been fumbling around talking about oil for the last, what have we done it four weeks straight now? And, uh, and all that. And I basically have been wrong historically throughout my career on, uh, on oil prices. So right. how did you get a jet then? <laughs> Good boy. <laughs> I never wired up early. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. The old Matt Simmons. I might try the, the clock right twice a day. The American clock. Uh, Mark, level set us on oil. We've kind of talked about it. We've talked about the age of volatility, et cetera, the last few weeks. But uh, chat about us because I know you've been just had opinions on China for a while now. Yeah. Uh, so when you look at where we are on the Brent side, you know, especially when you turn to the physical, I think you're starting to see that there's the there's no real support for the the how deep some of this correction has gone on the Brent side. I think you will start to see some of this come back up uh, in terms of the range. So we've been saying that uh, Brent was going to sit between a 73 and 77. So I would be a buyer down here just because of where we are. Uh, when you look at where the the market sits at this point, you know, distillate is or diesel gas oil uh, middle distillate if you're in asia you know those are things where you're starting to see some some uh movement back up which is a good thing in terms of some of the crack spreads in the u.s there's a, a huge oversupply in asia and the problem is right now is the middle east is the swing producer of refined products now, a lot of people that you know if when you're early or when you're late depending on how you're looking at the crude market a lot of times everybody just wants to talk oil supply and demand just you, but you have to talk refined products. You have to look at your largest buyer, which is the refiner, and what are the refiners doing? So you've had uh, South Korea, which is cut runs by five percent. You've had another one point seven percent of runs come down in China, and you have guys trying to protect crack spreads. So because of that, you've seen a little bit of stability in the DC. Gasoline is still my biggest concern. I would not. I would not want to be long gasoline at this point, especially given the amount that's sitting in Europe that's going to hit the uh, the East Coast. Uh, so you really have to look at what is DISTI doing because that's the one that's going to drive everything going forward. We're, we are coming out of turnarounds uh, uh, out of summer burn so that we'll put more crude on the water. We had said that Libya, uh, for those that don't know, they uh, there was some disagreement on how the money was being spent at the central bank so that individual has since left, but they did agree in in um, in broad strokes what should happen at the beginning of September. So obviously, as we know, broad strokes is one thing. You know who you who you're bringing in, how are you structuring it is another. So they did bring in someone. Uh, our view was that you were going to have crude flowing by October 15th. It looks like it's going to be about a week earlier. There were already VLCCs and ships heading to the Libyan coast. But at the same time, you have CPC uh, going into turnaround. So you're going to have less flow coming out of CPC. Iraq typically takes this time to do some of their turnarounds. UAE is going to be, uh, take advantage of this. And let's just say if you look at uh, 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 Dubai crude and you look at Brent, there's a competition there. Mm. 
uh, West Africa is struggling, uh, and, and I think that leads back to China. There's always been this obs obsession that China is going to stimulate, China is going to do all these things. It's like they will, but they've been stimulating since 2008, and there's a thing called law of diminishing returns. And eventually, every new dollar has a negative util, and you've hit that here, where there's there's the consumer is so overlevered, the cu the cu um, the customers, the corporations are so overlevered. You're not going to get exports back. So realistically, you had three. Uh, you were up to three bankruptcies. Sim, uh, Semkim uh, had three bankruptcies. You had a new mega refiner turning on. So that's going to change kind of the balance. I was expecting to see a much bigger uh, uh, export quota. Instead, they kept it lower. But right now, I think you have to look at where product is going from the Middle East. It's pushing into the Atlantic Basin. So over the next six weeks, we should see builds start to increase for distillate in pad three, because right now we have the, the most um, space in terms of uh, storage. But realistically, the physical market does not jive with the futures market. The futures market is overshot to the downside. I think you're going to see that get pulled back up and you're going to see this balancing act. Everyone's like, oh, Russia is going to make up their cuts. No, nobody wants their crude. It's, it's all tapped out. Which is why they it went back below the uh, the cap. So realistically, you're seeing this balancing, and I think the biggest issue at this point is going to be Russia. It won't isn't exporting as much crude. The U.S. is going to struggle to export above 3.8. You're going to get builds in pad three. So I think you you will get a range bound Brent, and I think you're going to get a lot of pressure into the distillate market as we head into November. Damn, that was good. Yeah. So what does this portend for what? OPEC Plus's decision relative to yeah. starting to feather yep. cuts back in. Great question. So my, so the moment they announced those cuts, I said that OPEC Plus is going to have to sit on those cuts for at least five years mm. or accept a fifteen pri a fifteen dollar price correction. So the moment they started doing what we like to call tape bombs in terms of let's test the market, how are they going to take this? I, I could have told you immediately how they were going to take it. It was terrible, and and that's where the only I think the earliest they can bring back crude at this point is March of next year. So when you look at and you start doing the, the barrel counting, uh, 2024 is a little bit tighter, which is a good thing. 2025 sucks, and 2025 is going to get really sloppy. And the last thing you want to do is bring crude back because Q1 is your worst month, uh, your worst quarter for crude demand. Why would you start? in front of that. You'd start on the back end of it to really help your pricing. Whoever's, um, not to th not to throw my soul out there, but I'd be happy to help them because whoever told them to go with production and not manage official selling prices and OSPs, it needs to be fired because OSPs is how you manage this, not by increasing, decreasing production because it, people hear it and they immediately think, oh, you're cutting production, good thing. Production and exports are two separate pieces. You know, they're bringing back and they've been building petrochemicals. They've been building refiners. Mm -hmm. So they're just essentially rejiggering what things are look look like and they're increasing their exports of, of uh, distillate, gasoline, kerosene, and trying to manage the market in terms of crude. But I think right now you're going to, the Atlantic Basin is going to be the one to set the price. And would so. you, would you say Russia's got the most acute price sensitivity just because you know, the ongoing grind to, to fund a hot war. Yeah. So when you look at, when you look at them, you have to look at the Urals and ESPO. So Urals is the one that is where they're going to get the most value from. Mm -hmm. And uh, Urals is below the, um, uh, the, the, the cap, not that the cap ever mattered, mattered, but it just gives you an idea that everybody's tapped out. So India is your, was your typical big buyer. India refused to buy from Iran because let's just say India was wasn't quite happy that the Houthis were shooting at their ships. So uh, so they've been turning to the, the Ural side. Uh, the one thing that Saudi did get right is they went after light, uh, light uh, Arab light into Asia, which essentially pulled all of the U.S. demand out of Asia. Yeah. So that was a good thing, which then supported ESPO going into the coast because the, the Chinese are, are, they're price sensitive. And when you get those price benefits, you're going to see some buying, and that's what you saw. You did get a nice little increase in purchasing, and some of that's going to go to the SPR. But people need to appreciate a physical uh, barrel of crude, and some of the I won't I won't name names, but 
some people that like to be very active on Twitter <laughs> like to think that if I buy a barrel of, of crude today, it's product tomorrow. It's like, no, there's a four month lag between, uh, you know, it has to get on a boat, has to get shipped, has to go into a tank, has to go to a refiner, has to go into another tank, has to go into the blender. So it's like, guys, th there's, there's a lag here. And, and there's also a natural hedge that's been t built into that in terms of the time spreads. But when you're when you're loading up the SPR, there is no time spread. You're not making anything on the back end. Right. So that's where China gets it, they they get very uh, good at taking the, their spots, and that's where they've been going in and taking advantage of Angola when it's available, Dubai, and then your roles in ESPL. So, Mark, if you'd, I just want to drill down into China itself and, and from the economy, sure. the, the central banks trying to push. Yeah, you know, lower mortgage rates. What, what do you see from an economic perspective over the next year in China? So the the problem is it's a structural problem. And, I, and I'm going to ask I'm going to ask Part B of that question. Do we see a negative growth rate out of China in the future on GDP? So short answer is yes to that. You will see it. <laughs> uh, it won't be it won't be actually published, but it will be negative. Okay. And the reason why is is because of the, yeah. the question on on the, the the consumer and what the PBOC is doing. To cr to credit the PBOC, I think they've actually handled this quite well. They have been very reluctant to do additional stimulus. They've been trying to manage liquidity, and that's when you have to look at credit impulse and. Yeah, you know, we can talk about the different M1 through M4 or M0 through M4, but you really want to focus on M2, M3, especially in China. And so when you look at credit impulses, what they've been trying to do is keep it below zero, which means that you're pulling liquidity out of the market and you're trying to manage that loan growth uh, increase. So they've been trying to take uh, some of that liquidity out, take some of those loans out just because you have you have weak assets. The problem is in specific, specifically in Asia. So the most exposed the US ever was to real estate at any one given time was in 2007 and it was 38%. In China, prior to the collapse in 2021, it was 64%. So when you look at how much the consumer had exposed to this real estate co correction, because people will say, oh, there's a ton of money in savings. It's like, well, what are the losses on the real estate side? And a lot of these buildings were never even built. So it's not like you can go to the market and liquidate because what are you liquidating? You're, you're, it's air in the sky. There's nothing right, there nothing to there. sell. <clears throat> so you have individuals that are taking it on the chin. You had these SPVs or the special purpose vehicles, special purpose bonds that were structured by the municipalities and, the, and on the provincial side that are going towards essentially negative yielding infrastructure plans. Mm. So there, the big focus has been, we have to protect ex exports, we have to protect infrastructure, but at what cost? So you have a multiplier effect of how effective is your dollar versus that's invested, that's what is it generating. If we think of the US, you have the highway system, for every dollar spent into the highway system, you had $5 of GDP growth when it was initially built. So for every dollar invested, you made five. Easily cover infl uh, inflation, you know, interest, principal. There, you're closer to about 0.87, oh. which means that for every dollar you're investing, you're only making 87 cents. So forget principal, you, uh, interest, you can't even cover principal. So now you have this, this structure where they're going to try to bring the consumer along, but Asian culture is very much a saving culture. They're not going to look to go out there and overspend. You were relying on corporations, and if you look- Except their Hermes bags, but that's a- Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, but then if you look at the only people that have been that have been taking loans are state-owned or government-owned, which they're just cycling that through. So when you look at the actual movement, I think you you are seeing negative growth. You are seeing a slowdown in FDI, that's or foreign direct investment, mm -hmm. that's not gonna pick up. Way down. Yeah. And so you, you were oversold. So everyone's like, oh, Look at out. Look at the stocks. It's like, yeah. Well, you've been oversold for the last three years. Of course, you're going to have a, a, a short squeeze. But in terms of actually being a movement, and I think that leads to your point, the consumer is not going to drive it. Infrastructure is already already showing some uh, uh, weakness. You were relying on exports, and as the global economy slows it, at at a greater clip, exports is going to slow down. So I think it's less going to be neg negative. It's just going to be no growth. And my whole comment during this whole time is it's not, are we having a hard landing or soft landing? It's the duration of the landing. 
And I think that's where people get it wrong. Good point. Now, now China is, is Hermes number one mm -hmm. uh, country in the world in terms of buyers. That's going to be interesting to watch. But yes. let's go, since we're talking about long lead times, I mean, we're building a coal plant, we've talked about it's one a week or one, two a week or whatever the real metric is. Those are long-term decisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, those were made years ago and they're getting green lighted. What do you see happening on this sort of infrastructure build in China now that we're seeing a pressure really kind of at its at its peak? So the thing that's beautiful about China and and you're watching the failure of a planned economy in, in real time, they want it splashy. So mm -hmm. you're, you have all this power gen, but they also have a lot of these high powered wire lines. Now the problem is when you have a high voltage wire line, the amount of step downs you have to create in order mm -hmm. to pull that off the wire is extensive. And if you look at what they've done, they've created generation and they've created all these splashy high voltage lines, but look at the step downs. So there's huge pockets where electricity is plentiful and large oh, no, lots of area. No that step downs. There's, there's nothing. So it, it's like, yeah, okay, I built this really cool thing. It's really fast and it's the most technologically advanced that you have. It's like, but what about the, the, the mom and pop that needs, you know, 240 uh, volts and they, uh, and they can't get it because what's going overhead would blow up their facility. Right. And you need to see a more structured uh, uh, breakdown with more step downs in order to actually make all of this infrastructure viable. So there's not enough industrial, incremental industrial demand to incentivize those step downs. Correct. Essentially. So then they're just passing over and, and that's where they're trying to do this rural redevelopment because they're, they finally rec are recognizing their failure, but to create a step down into an already constructed, utilized high voltage line is very dangerous, very expensive. And I stuck my finger in the socket <laughs> when I was young. I remember that. That hurt. Well, it's touching a, 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 a kite to one of those things so it would more than hurt. But yeah, <laughs> but, exactly. but it's it's funny when you look at just how they've constructed it, and I think that's going to be the biggest. Uh, but I, I don't. Not to say that you guys are calling GE or Siemens anytime soon, but call up Siemens or GE for a uh, a transformer. They'll be like, oh. When do you want it in 2030? Yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. Is, I know. It is not a 2020 and uh, to the point on natural it, gas. Center point serves us. You don't yeah. have to tell us that <laughs> story. <laughs> yeah, we know it all too well. well it, it's funny because back to the point on natural gas, it's, it's interesting because people are finally recognizing we need more natural gas turbines. But Siemens and GE went so, so hard into the wind side that yeah. now if you want a gas turbine, they're like, sure. Uh, do would you like it in 2032 or 2033? Absolutely. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Excuse me, isn't it your main business? But uh, that's there's uh, another and but then you have China who's trying to fix this and they're buying up as much as they can and staying in the queue. Last last thing on oil price because then we'll we'll, uh, we'll go to wind and our resident wind expert uh, over here. Two-part question. Number one, what's going on with U.S. supply? I don't get it. How are we producing this much oil? I've been chicken little for the last seven years. The sky's falling, and we produce more. And then two, I'm, I'm old, and I remember in my career, whenever bombs go off in the Middle East, <laughs> oil prices go up. Yeah. And why isn't that happening? Because it feels like we're on the verge of World War III. So it, it's funny. I think we're, and this is going to sound crazy, and I, I, I have written about this since 2021. I actually think we're closer to long-term peace in the Middle East than we've ever been in our history. Well, I, and, 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 Damn, and that's going to be Clyde. That's going to be on the AI <laughs> no, but, most searched term, peace no, in the Middle no, East. Yeah. But th that's always been the thing about the Middle East is when it's the darkest is right before the dawn you know you yeah. got to get to that bad point and, and then agreements get so well for his yeah, point colleague pointed so out you know and i it just like watched it. one of the one of the <laughs> has last few dawn. weeks of shows you're gonna come on guys you're gonna get us yanked off youtube because uh, you're singing a <laughs> a a, 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 a copyrighted song and, and basically <laughs> that you know we've we've had pockets of these events attacks, bombings, whatever. And if you think back to, I forget when Abcake out of Yemen was, that was, yeah. uh, that was uh, 2018 maybe? Yes. 
Yeah, 2017, 28. Same yeah. tepid reaction. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's kind of chicken little from the other side. We've got, mm -hmm. you know, resilient U.S. production. We've got a whole bunch behind the valve with OPEC. We've got, there, there's just so much that, you know, these headline events just never materialize. Yeah. And now you have the added fundamental overhang uh, that's growing that you just I've talked about in China, which is, yeah. oh, in Libya. Yeah, and it's interesting that you said it because the demand is going to be your cap. And to your point, when you look at what has happened, people get fatigued. And, and that's why geopolitical risk goes up and then it fades because it when you, and, and I think to, to your point, or when Iran didn't mm -hmm. respond to the Tehran, uh, to the assassination in Tehran, to essentially everything that has happened to date in Lebanon, people are starting to look at this and be like, wait, can Iran respond? And my answer has been no, they can't. It, any response would be tepid. Any response would show that there's underlying weakness. And it comes to the drain on Russian resources because Russia was, supply, was supplying a lot of that to, uh, to uh, Iran. The Quds have had significant issues. The IRGC has had significant supply chain disruptions because of bombings. And, <clears throat> and what Israel has been willing to do, which we have been unwilling to do, it's changed the rules of engagement as the engagement changes from the other side. And they've been very quick to do it. And one of our biggest mistakes, and you know, you can blame whoever you want on this, in terms of how we've handled the Red Sea, we just let it happen. We shoot them out of the sky. But at some point, you really have to change the rules of engagement because if, if, if we can know people's color of their eyes from indoors, from space, we know where these things are getting launched from before they launched. Right. That's and right. there's no reason we can't go in, in there and do it ahead of time. And I think that Israel is, is, is willing to go in there. I th this is my overarching theme. The GCC is going to sit back. They're going to let Israel go through. They're going to uh, get rid of Hamas. They're going to get rid of Hezbollah. Then uh, I, I believe that Israel will then turn to Saudi Arabia and say, here's the case, case of the kingdom. We'll be the military supporting you. You set up whatever Sunni government you want in place. It'll be linked to the GCC. India has a huge amount of interest in this because India and the Persians have been friends for thousands of years. The Persians were the ones that brought the Jewish population to this region on the Israelis because Cyrus the Great is great for a lot of reasons, as well as his son, bringing them from Egypt into this region. Persians, Indians, uh, you know, uh, you know, Hindis, and and Western Europeans have been friends for 2,500 2, years. You know, forty five years of of a hiccup, if you will, is not going to change the way the people view us. Is not going to change the way the people view India. They do not like the Chinese. They are they distrust them in terms of how they are. So it's really, they would rather go back to the Indian side of the equation. Yeah. India has structured deals with the GCC, uh, specifically uh, UAE and Kuwait. Qatar has been on the losing side of every decision they've made. They're now sitting backwards. Israel has now gone from going after uh, the Hezbollah. They're now going after, after the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. which makes Egypt happy, which is why I think they're going to be able to go to the, um, to, uh, the port they're going to be able to go to the crossing, and I think that there's going to be a lot of long-term benefits. And I believe wholeheartedly that the regime will fall by in Iran by 2030, and we will be doing business in Iran by 2035. Mark, I want to believe you, but but that seems way too logical. Where can your idea go sideways due to mm -hmm. egos, anger, politics? So good question, and it's how much it does MBS and Saudi Arabia control versus the UAE. That's a good question. Because the UAE has really been the testing ground, but the uh, so Saudi and, and the UAE were friends for, for a long time, and then it, things started to fracture during Yemen mm -hmm. when they were going in and trying to go after the Houthis because each one had their own proxies on the ground. The, some of their proxies started fighting each other, obviously an issue. The UAE also spent 15 billion some odd dollars to increase their um, their spare capacity, and Saudi was trying to keep it on the sidelines, and that created a lot of friction. So I think at this point, to, to your to your point, there was a a big focus on money and power and influence. 
I think both sides are starting to recognize that a peaceful Yemen, a, well, yeah, a peaceful Iran, a peaceful Yemen, and a peaceful mm -hmm. Lebanon, everybody makes money. Everyone wins. And I think it. the question is, to your point, can they maintain that when the money starts to flow, the influence starts to happen? And I, I, I like to think that it can because the GCC so far has been very much united in terms of Kuwait, um, UAE, and Saudi being the main drivers behind that. The question is, do they start to fracture as cash flows? Okay, so, more more important question. Chuck, yeah, get to, this is yeah. the most important question in the region. You know, the salaries are building their own airline. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's be better or worse in Emirates? Yeah. As someone who's been on it, <laughs> I can tell you it's worse. They lost my luggage. It was sitting in France. It took them three days to get it to me. Uh, so Emirates is a whole whatever the, whatever they if they try to do it they should go to the emirates sit there watch how they do things go to Qantas, watch how they do things and then create it because it's not it hasn't been a positive some experience. of the best investing experiences just go and watching how they do yeah. small things even though an airline is not a small thing but this is interesting it'll be interesting to see how that plays out it, it's been it's been terrible like the and it's funny that you that you bring that up because it's a cultural thing Right, because they don't have an appreciation, at least my experience, in terms of timeliness and customer service, and that has been the biggest linchpin in terms of uh, doing that. And they brought Delta in to try to fix it, and uh, <laughs> it, so far it is it has not gone as as planned. So if the so UAE, that's where I would if, turn, if, but... if the UAE actually had more control over the GCC, let's say mm -hmm. they do which I don't think they do. I think the, the Saudis to always sort of be powerful. That would probably change everything that happens in Israel and the surrounding region. Yeah, in a good way. In, right. Because in, in the, the Jordanians and what it, it's interesting, and, and I think the tell for me was how this was changing was when the Saudis looked up in the sky and like, so you're flying suicide drones and missiles over my, uh, my landscape? Uh, not anymore. And that was the dividing line. And and that was when you saw the Saudis starting shooting them down, the Jordanians. Because when you look at the topography of Israel, you actually want to come over the mountains. So the way you hide a missile is you keep it low, slow, uh, and, and you use the mountain's terrain to confuse the systems. So you have to get it when it's flat and, and, uh, and you can actually distinguish between. So by the Saudis taking and actually going after these missiles, that was a clear indication they were supporting Israel because if they did nothing, right. they a lot of those. I mean, there was the U.S. was there, Israel was there, but they had to be on other people's airspace in order to do it. And the fact that there was a lot of openness between that, and I think people underestimate how much the Israelis did in the Sinai Peninsula for Egypt. Mm -hmm. That there, there's a lot there. The Lebanese people, for the most part, do not want Hezbollah. Like they are tired. I mean, everyone forgets the Beirut explosion. I mean, that was that was Hezbollah that killed hundreds and damaged you know billions. I mean, of dollars Beirut used to you Beirut used to be like a Paris. I mean, it was exactly. you know, a place to go. It was the it was the uh, was, I mean, was it the cheap Riviera is what they called it. Or yeah, that's right. Was, I mean, and, and and it was. But I think that they were my Persian friends that talk about you know how great the the country was back in the seventies. How people oh, were beautiful mm -hmm. and were and extravagant clothing the food there is amazing right uh, the the form the oldest there. the oldest uh cuisine on the planet mm -hmm. yeah i i mean if i, I thought it was pizza <laughs> <laughs> lamb i'm telling you 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 want to go and have some of the lebanese lamb Love best it. lamb out there and then uh you know farming a lot of things so i i i do think that there is a and, and just I, I do a lot on generational cycles and when you look at it generationally, people are just tired of it. Mm -hmm. And so, I think that's how you get the So, future. So la la last question while we're there. First, I'm going to toot my own horn just so it's in collide and I can look this up. At 2015, at the University of Texas Law Symposium, they said, make a forecast. And I said, the regime will be overthrown in Iran and Iran will be our strongest ally in the Middle East by 2025. So okay. I still got a year. Okay. I yeah. still got a year. Okay. So I'm in there. You're yeah. you're you're I like five, it. I like you're, it. you're five years, but I I did say that. And of course somebody came up and said, Why do you think that? Oh, I just made it up. I wanted <laughs> to say something controversial. But uh given everything you just laid out about the Middle East, fascinating. I don't want to get overly 
political <laughs> on it, but does it matter who gets elected president in the United States this time? And the interesting th- fact I heard is that Jared Kushner and MBS supposedly truly bonded yeah. and it was over Call of Duty. Yes. Those guys would sit there and play Call of Duty just hours on end and they actually bonded. Probably still do. So the the short answer is yes. Uh, it, I think it matters more that Trump wins than Kamala because Trump is seen as someone who won't listen to the UN, will go quote unquote rogue, and that keeps him kind of a guessing game. He was also willing to, so not to go too into it, I did, a, I did geopolitical analysis and I worked with the military back in Jordan, but the S-400s have <clears throat> have issues. So we have THAAD, which is what we use as our anti-missile defense. THAAD is a, is a hive. So every, the moment something is launched, every computer starts to calculate trajectory. The S-400s live within themselves. So if you have to line up S-400s, which are the Russian anti-missile, uh, anti-aircraft defense, and you can have gaps. So what did Trump do uh, when when things were starting to get heated? He sent about, you know, what was it, 200, 150 uh, Patriot missiles? And the, the point of it was to show we know the weaknesses and we can destroy them at will. And I think that that was a very much, you know, carry a big stick, but walk softly. I'm going to show you. No one's going to die, but I'm going to show you what I can do. And, and I think that that helped. And I think that kept, keeps him uh, honest and other people honest. If Kamala wins, I think that it will happen still in terms of that piece, because Israel has shown they're willing to go at it alone. And and they, they don't care if they get UN condemnation. They don't care if they get uh, support. So I think that is the big divide, but I do think Trump would accelerate that because I think he made the right move in in removing the um, the Iran um, nuclear treaty. I and I and and how do I know that that how do I think that's the case is because it hasn't come back, and if it came back, then and and I think this is what is missed with U.S. Uh, foreign policy. Biden kept a lot of the same policies when you look at Iran, when you look at China. There wasn't a huge change. And I think that there has been some consistency and uh, from Obama when, and I think the turning point was what I call the Rose Garden lie when President Xi was sitting there and saying, oh, no, no, we're just doing um, uh, oceanography and we're just, don't, don't, don't even look at those shawls, don't even look at those islands. And then within six months, you had battery, um, anti, uh, anti-ship batteries and advanced radar. So I think that was the pivot for both sides. And I think that that's something that would actually be a very part bipartisan uh, piece in terms of the Middle East and the way we address the Middle East and China. So, so very much like Trump allegedly showing the Taliban leader. Yeah. His house. His house. His house. That, that, that was, that was a Reagan thing where, oh, Lockerbie. Oh, you want Lockerbie? I'm going to, where's your daughter sleep? Oh yeah. I'm going to send a Patriot missile through her window. And that way, and then all of a sudden Gaddafi uh, didn't say much for a uh, of what, 30 years? Yeah. Right. Well, I, I think what the IDF has demonstrated is that bunkers 90 feet underground aren't deep enough. J, J dams, nothing like a bunker buster. Those, and uh, th- uh, that was uh, th- <laughs> my favorite. Uh, I had to read it twice, 90 yeah. feet. Not, not not to go down a rabbit hole, but have you seen how they uh, they they put like a tracker when they shook hands with them and that was how they No. So some of the, after, you know, you want to say that it's not possible, but I guarantee you that somebody in, in the James Bond novel wrote about blowing up beepers and then the editor's script like just scratched it saying that's not believable and it happened. So I think all things are possible with the with the way and how deep some of these Mossad CIA operatives really go. Crazy. Impressive. Kirk, you want to hit us on uh, on offshore wind? I mean, it's it's just um, more of the same. And we're going to come back to something that Mark said earlier, but Tina Kotek, who's the governor of, of Oregon, she's seen as a considered a progressive Democrat. She is for, you know, affordable housing, raising minimum wage, healthcare reform. And she's been a big advocate for sort of clean energy, for climate action, renewable energy. Well, she has been protesting Biden's auction off Oregon coast for offshore wind. Um, There was really only one bidder. So it actually had very little interest, just like in the Gulf of Mexico. 
But but the fact that she stood up as an advocate saying, wait a minute, we need to actually, and one, and part of her statement was we need to plan better. We're, we're just throwing this shit up, which is interesting because having a home in Nantucket, as you know, and um, a surfer being pulled out of the water for three weeks of summer because of one blade falling into the ocean and creating fucking debris everywhere on our coast. And, and having heard the actual communications from the company saying, we never believe that this would happen, number one. But number two, we never believe that the water would throw these broken debris on Nantucket seems like a entire smoke screen here. Um, having followed a lot of the whale, save the whale people out of New Jersey and Nantucket and others, this has been an issue for a long time. People were very concerned about offshore wind, but people have said, let's just push it. Let's push it. What's interesting here about Oregon is that you have a progressive saying, wait a minute. And, and I think it's beyond the economics because offshore wind economically just doesn't make sense. It's It's got to make other sense, which is we're going to ruin the planet. But when you see a progressive saying, and if Oregon of all places, which is probably one of the more pristine states in the entire union, it's beautiful. Them saying, hell no, in my backyard, I think sends, sends a very strong signal. I'd love to hear, Mark, what, what is your take? I, I 100% agree. And, and it's interesting because when as someone is in New York, you know, they – the the recent wind farm had was going to sell power at i think it was 81 dollars a megawatt hour they then had to cancel and rebook it at 182 dollars a megawatt hour because the economics shifted it's like no your economics were always wrong and now always it's, wrong. it's it's a much bigger problem and and one of the things that in my insights coming out for c6 it's in a five minute period a wind farm can go from three percent utilization rate to 77 percent utilization rate there is not a system in this world that can handle that level of volatility coming on. And the problem is these transformers are physical. Like things are physically moving up and down to right. manage your voltage, to manage your hertz. You're, you're wearing down your systems, not only just at the wind farm itself, but also the, inter, the interconnection, the grid itself. And now I, I think the ISOs are getting, which are the independent system operators, which are supposed to be agnostic and trying to just balance the grid, are coming out and saying, if you build wind, if you build solar, that's fine, but I have to go out and get my base load to we offset can't handle you it, right. because we can't handle it. Yeah, and over the life cycle, all those, you know, the volatility causes higher frequency maintenance, replacement, et cetera. Quote the police, synchronicity. And, and <laughs> yeah. The way I've looked at it, you know, we've, we've talked about the handful of... Um, cancellations or shelving of projects uh, on the East Coast, the, you're, you're talking about kind of changing the, the framework of the economics because reality sets in, and I don't care what factor has caused you to do that. That's just the physical Absolutely. reality of it. I think we're seeing, blinding insight here, the PUC is ultimately saying we've reached a point of tolerance with what we're going to you know, what, what added burden we're going to put on the ratepayer base. Absolutely. And, and to the point that when you look at the, so my wife is from Rhode Island, so I'm up in that area quite, quite often. And the Nantucket red was, was on purpose. That's why you bring it up the Nantucket side. So the, <laughs> the, the problem that you have is these, the QC failures now. So when you look at this, that the blade that failed, they went back and they said, oh, that, that should have been caught. And we estimate there's at least 150 blades that are currently out there, either in transit or installed that could, that have the same failure. So now they have to go up or, or if it's on the ground and do a, a, uh, a, essentially an ultrasound on all of these assets in order to find if the epoxy was, was put on appropriately. Then Siemens had the same thing happen in, uh, in uh, what was it, uh, Oslo where they had an, uh, another failure and it was something similar. And if you look at how many failures there's been, how how there hasn't been a a focus on quality and and just this rush to market because it's like we have to do this now and now people are saying okay, we went too far. We went too far too fast. Time to back up and actually look at this in a structural way. Unfortunately, there's a lot of damage that's happened to date. There's a lot of damage that has to be fixed. The thing that killed me though is when they came back and said that 
it's safe for animals to eat the fiberglass. I was like, okay, if that's true, I want my plastic straws back because if they can eat a plastic <laughs> straw and they, if they can eat fiberglass, they can eat a straw because what, what are, we, are we being absurd here? So, you know, a friend of mine, uh, when I was, um, years ago, he was buying properties and he had about 75 properties and we're in this little forum and I'm like, uh, named re, re, remained nameless. It's like, you know, I, this is really bothering me. I love your strategy. If, if the real estate appreciates, you're going to be, you're going to make so much money. I was like, but let me ask you a question. Operationally, I'm like, you're low income housing. You've got 75 of these. I don't believe you can actually make money because of the cost to uh, people will not take care of your asset. They're going to throw semen in your toilets. You're going to have to upgrade shit. I'm like, I just don't think, I think you're underestimating the operational cost. And I was taught by a very brilliant billionaire how to do everything from the ground up. Michael Dell, thank you very much. But um, this never made sense to me because when I came into Shell for the first time, one of our big investments that I had to manage was we invested with Google into a cool wind idea. It's a floating, we launch it. It's a kite that floats high in the sky and generates. And I'm thinking a kite. I'm like, the wind doesn't always blow up there. Maybe it does. And it's floating and it's a kite that's just sort of flying around in, in, in the air and it's going to generate power for, uh, I'm like, what? I'm like, we made this investment. Like, yeah, it's a great idea. I'm like, okay, that's a shitty idea. And I know that's venture investment, but let's go to your, our wind business. I was like, let's talk through this. And they're like, yeah, this is how we're going to make money. And I was looking at the economics going, there is no fucking way to make money in this business. And finally, YL came in going, this is bullshit. We're cutting this shit out. But I'm like, there must be crazy people. I mean, Siemens, GE, Shell, you name it. Um, I mean, think about uh, uh, Dong Energy that's Orsted. I mean, what a Dong though. They probably are regretting now that they've rebranded because Orsted at the time was like, this is the most amazing company ever. And when things are too good to be true, they're good to, too good to be true. I mean, this is what we're seeing playing out. It's finally coming home to roost. That doesn't make any sense. Well, and, and when you look at BP, Orsted, Equinor, they're looking at it where they're going to do this and they're assuming 6% margins and that was with subsidies it's like with I, subsidies yeah i was like and everything going right yeah i, I was mean, like we've all built models right exactly. and a lower, and a lower so, cost of capital and and that was so it's funny that you bring that up because when i was at cop 28 one of the things that i i i spoke about was that rates were wrong and that you were going to see the 10 year get back to four four and a half percent even with what powell did i think people forget that powell sets the overnight rate the market sets the yield curve and people like to think that that's not true, unless we start doing yield control curve, which we saw how that ends in Japan. But the thing that I brought up is it's not that rates are wrong, it's that your hurdle rate is wrong. And Absolutely. I think people need to reassess their hurdle rates because everyone at, at COP20 was like, we need cheap rates. It's like, why? You had 2% rates for how long and how much infrastructure did you build? Yeah. Should you have been building infrastructure at 2%? Absolutely. How much did you build that was worthwhile? And now that rates are at 4%, which at the time I was at COP28, they were, so the 10-year was below the long-term running average. The long-term running average is 4.28%, and the 10-year was at 4.23%. So it's like, so let me get this straight. We could build, we could go from the vacuum tube to the microprocessor at 17%. We can build the internet at 2%, uh, at 6%, but at 2%, that's too high. At 4%, that's too high. <laughs> no, that's not too high. Your hurdle rate is wrong and you need to reassess where, to your to everyone's point here, 6% margins? What? Like, you could, you, if you miss a cement uh, delivery, 6% is it's gone. gone. I mean, it's like, what are you, what are we talking then about Then the wind here? blows 30 miles an hour and boom, these, these offshore wind farms are blowing up. You yeah. know, you can't even handle the governors when the governors fail. Uh, that's when it gets real scary. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's amazing. Well, Mark, it's been awesome having you, uh, having you on standing invite anytime you want to come back. Absolutely. Um, the, I do want to end on a little bit of a sad note here and, uh, Jacob, let's cut in Collins tribute to, uh, Scott Gale. I don't know if you guys knew Scott Gale, but just 
a great dude uh, stood up Halliburton Labs and uh, was just a big, huge bull for our industry. And Colin says it way more eloquently than I do. So watch, watch Colin's clip of it. I want to start off the night with uh, uh, giving a tribute to a good friend of mine. And Jesus Christ, this light is uh, right in my eyes. Um, a good friend of mine, Scott Gale. Um, a lot of y'all probably know Scott. Scott is longtime oil field guy, longtime Halliburton, and was responsible for standing up Halliburton Labs. And uh, Scott's been battling colon cancer for the last four years. And I visited him, him this weekend. And sorry, I get a little tripped up when I'm talking about him, but visited him in a hospice this weekend and had a really deep conversation with him. And I want to give a tribute to him because one, I respect the hell out of Scott. Um, during this entire process, you know, he's a young guy, 40 years old, has several young kids and he's held his head up high during this entire process. I've never seen him mope about having cancer. He's never been down and he's just continued building the entire time, was able to stand up Halliburton Labs, how to deal with the corporate antibodies that come out and all the resistance of trying to stand that up. And then uh, he was a primary driver for this week for the Houston uh, Energy and Climate Startup Week. I mean, um, was a huge contributor to it. And in my conversation with him uh, this weekend, you know, one was a very difficult conversation. I've never had to tell a friend uh, goodbye before. And so we were able to, you know, just get really deep and we're talking about you know, the meaning of life. And, you know, Scott lived his life with so much intention and purpose. And he was talking about how grateful he was to work in the energy industry and do good and power the world and, and make society better. And just kind of really opened up my eyes to how important the work is that we do. And Scott has a uh, saying that everyone, everyone knows is a Scott saying it's onward, onward. And, and that was the last thing that he told me. He's like, it's been a hell of a ride onward. And so I just want to encourage everyone tonight to, walk away with with a message here of the the work that we do is important and you should wake up every day knowing that you have purpose in your life and wake up with intention and uh provide the world with a service that is very much needed so wanted to say that everyone be thinking about scott tonight i wish he could be here with us we miss him dearly i do want to share one thing and i'm usually a big fan of like if somebody texts me something I won't, I won't share it. I'm, I'm pretty good at keeping my mouth shut, but I thought this was too priceless. Uh, Scott was in hospice kind of, you know, the last, let's call it a couple of months. And we were texting back and forth and I was talking about coming to see him. And uh, the quote was, it would be my nightmare to need mouth to mouth and only have Chuck Yates by my side. <laughs> and so a man that can, you know, keep that level of sense of humor uh, was just a great guy. And so anyway, I got a text from his dad when he passed and said that Scott considered you one of his good friends. I was like, man, what? I mean, I didn't know Scott that well, but it was awesome to hear that, you know, as those of us that have been trying to stand up and be part of the community here in Houston. I mean, that was something that Scott didn't need to tell his dad to do, but it really set me back saying, you know, Scott was one of the good guys that yeah, worked really I mean, hard to try to make others successful. And, you know, uh, yeah. God rest his soul for sure. Yeah, no, it, it will not surprise me if I drank too much wine one night here uh, sometime soon and listen to the podcast we did because uh, that was great fun. So. Anyway, awesome. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, if you like the show, please forward it to a friend, subscribe, make comments, not comments about my girth because the camera adds 10 pounds.